a former U.S. Senate speechwriter, congressional press secretary, and magazine editor, editor Alan Pell Crawford, has published essays on politics and history in the New York Times, the Independent of London, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, National Review, and the Weekly Standard. He's reviewed books on U.S. history, politics, and culture for the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal since 1993. Alan has been a resident scholar at a wonderful place just up the road, George Washington's Mount Vernon, uh, my previous employment, the uh, International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and the Boston Athenaeum. He is the author of several books, including Unwise Passions, A True Story of a Remarkable Woman, and The First Great Scandal of 18th Century America, Twilight at Monticello, The Final Years of Thomas Jefferson, and most recently, and what we're all here today to learn about, his wonderful, entertaining new book, How Not to Get Rich, The Financial Misadventures of Mark Twain. <laughs> so we'll hear more about his book and about Mark Twain in Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Alan Crawford. Thank you, Jamie. Um, you know, we're all familiar, I think, with the story of how Mark Twain's death was greatly exaggerated. <laughs> now, there, actually, there were two times in which this took place. The first one, the one we're all familiar with, was in 1897 in London. But the second one, and the one you're going to hear about for probably for the first time today, occurred uh, in 1907, 10 years later and three years before Mark Twain's death. This was during uh, Twain's last visit to the Old Dominion. He had come here for something called the Jamestown Exposition. The Jamestown Exposition was a kind of world's fair uh, in celebrating the 300th anniversary of the first uh, permanent English settlement in the New World. Now, uh, at this ex exposition were steam engines, uh, motor, uh, new forms of, of motorized engines. Uh, there, was, there were automobiles displayed. And Mark Twain was crazy about these kind of technological advancements. He was also crazy about the inventors who made them possible and the investors and venture capitalists who brought them to the market. He was also something of a speculator himself. And as you read How Not to Get Rich, which I recommend highly. Um, <laughs> and by that, I don't mean that you check it out of the Richmond Public Library, as fine an institution as that is. Uh, he, was, he was crazy about this stuff, always looking to the future, always thinking there was a, the next big thing. And one person in, in particular, one uh, uh, robber baron of the period that he was very fond of was a man named uh, Henry Huddleston Rogers. Now Rogers he got to know as a Standard Oil vice president who founded the Richmond Railway Company. Excuse me, the Virginia Railway Company. Uh, Rogers and Twain became very close friends and it was as a guest of Rogers on Rogers' yacht called the Kanawha that Twain came to Jamestown in 1907. Uh, somehow the word got out that Mark Twain was coming. And so people were very excited about this. They, um, uh, and when, when the Kanawha pulled into the bay, uh, the crowds formed in the docks and the other boats, and they began to shout for Mark Twain to come out and greet them, which he did. He came out of the boat in his white suit and doffed his hat, and the crowd went crazy. Uh, when it he, the reporters followed him everywhere around Jamestown, but when it came time to leave, Rogers decided he would go back by rail, go back to New York City by rail, and Twain would get, would get on the, the yacht and sail up. <coughs> Unfortunately, there was a very thick fog settled over the bay, and the, uh, the boat, uh, Twain was marooned on the Kanawha for several days, if you can use the word marooned to apply to being on a boat. Uh, and while Twain was on this boat, by one description, servants 
rushed about, working their arms off, cracking ice, and plucking the tender leaves of the fragrant herbs in the preparation of a certain famous concoction guaranteed to dispel sorrow and lighten hearts that are heavy. As good Virginians, you'll know this was the mint julep. Eventually, the fog lifts, the boat sails, Twain wakes up safe and sound back home in New York. But the New York newspapers don't seem to have understood this. It was reported by the New York Times that the Kanawha had been lost at sea and Mark Twain had drowned. Uh, Apparently, this, room, this was a rumor that started in the Hampton newspaper. I think it was the, the, the Leisure Dispatch, who I believe was the name of the paper. Someone here will correct me. Um, but it was r reported by the New York Times, which I think proves that small provincial newspapers can be just as incompetent and irresponsible as great <laughs> metropolitan papers like the New York Times. <laughs> Twain's response was characteristic. He, when he learned this news, he issued a statement to the press as follows. He plans to conduct an exhaustive investigation of this report that I have been lost at sea. If there is any foundation for this report, I will at once apprise the anxious public. <laughs> Apparently what had happened was as a kind of prank, Rogers of Standard Oil had uh, alerted officials back in Virginia that his boat had, been, had, had lo been lost at sea and sent out a call for a search party to find it. I don't, know, uh, I don't know anything about the statute of limitations, not a lawyer, but I'm thinking maybe the Commonwealth could sue Standard Oil <laughs> for the expenses of this search party plus interest. And I also understand that Standard Oil operates today as BP. And in that case, their lawyers have a lot of experience at defending against such claims. <laughs> I'm, I offer that gratis, and now I'll return to the larger subject of Mark Twain's relationship to the Old Dominion and whether he was, as alleged, a member of the first families of Virginia. By his background, as you know, Mark Twain was born in uh, Hannibal, in, in Florida, Missouri, not Hannibal, in 1835. His father was a man named John Marshall Clemens. John Marshall Clemens had been born in Campbell County, Virginia. In, in, when Mark Twain's daughter Susie was 13, she wrote a biography of her father, which was published several, a number of years later under the title Papa. It's a charming book. It's a short book. I wouldn't recommend it as scholarship, I don't think Susie spent time in the archives at the Virginia Historical Society. There are no footnotes and no bibliography. It's a book of oral history. And in it, she says that her, maternal, her paternal grandfather, John Marshall Clemens, was, as she put it, a member of the FFV of Virginia, which she spells with an E. Uh, Mark Twain himself alluded to this uh, in an autobiography, pub one of the many autobiographies he wrote, this one published after his death, in which he said that, the, that poor John Marshall Clemens, who was a failed lawyer and a failed innkeeper, uh, and a terrible businessman, had left the family nothing in terms of money, but, Twain said, a sumptuous stock of pride and a good old name. A good old name, Mark Twain, of course, immediately changed for commercial purposes. <laughs> uh, the middle name Langhorn, Samuel Langhorn Clemens, is interesting because Twain said that this was, he was named for um, an old and dear friend of his father's. Who exactly that is, we're not sure. That the name that comes to mind, and this is one I always have difficulty pronouncing, would be Chiseled Dabney Langhorn of Langhorn House in Danville and a house called Meridor in Albemarle. 
uh, this, this Langhorn was the founder of the C&O Railroad and better known today as the father of Lady Nancy Astor. Uh, I think that's the, probably not a good candidate because this Langhorn would have been four years old when Mark, Twain di Mark Twain's father died. <laughs> Further research is indicated. Mark Twain's mother's name, mother's name was Jane Lampton. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about her ancestry, but it does not see, it seems to be Kentucky and Tennessee. But her oral history of her family also includes claims to an illustrious lineage. She had an eccentric nephew who decided that he, he did his research and decided he was the rightful fourth Earl of Durham back in England, and he expected people to address him as such. Uh, Twain's uh, a attitude toward ancestral pride is uh, typically uh, forbearing and comical. I think the, the, one of the wonderful passages in all of American literature is in The Innocents Abroad, which as you know was his first big hit, which tells of his travels to, Eng to Europe and the Holy Land on a cruise ship with a number of other uh, prominent uh, American socialites who uh, were on one of the first such pleasure cruise ships to, to, to exist. And on that, uh, on that trip in the Holy Land, the, the uh, tour guide tells Twain that they are standing at the grave of Adam. <laughs> that Adam. <laughs> and Twain says, <coughs> How touching it was, here in the land of strangers, far away from home and friends, and all who cared for me, thus to discover the grave of a blood relation. <laughs> True, he said it was a distant one, but still a relation. The foundation of my filial affection was stirred to its profoundest depth, and I gave way to tumultuous emotion. I leaned upon a pillar and burst into tears. I deem it no shame to have wept over the grave of my poor dead relative. <laughs> now, uh, now uh, there's a wonderful little book, and it, it should be stocked here at the Historical Society bookstore, called The Virginia Gentleman, A Field Guide and an Owner's Manual and a Way of Life. It's been written by a lawyer in Arlington, I believe, named Richard Crouch, who describes himself on the cover as an undistinguished amateur of no great achievement, a lifelong Virginian with a respectable rural background, an attorney with military experience, a worried rural landowner, and a lover of hunting and, and historic ex preservation, which I think positions him very well to write this book. And some of what he says describing the characteristics of a Virginia gentleman are not only relevant, but they're very well expressed. He says, the primary distinguishing feature of the Virginia gentleman is by all means his modesty. This is not generally known. <laughs> In fact, it seems that many people consider the same gentleman to be distinguishable by his pride and wonder just what it is in the Virginia of modern times that he has to be so proud of. But it is the Virginia gentleman's chief concern to be modest. What is truly unfortunate is that so many people don't realize his modesty is what he is so insufferably pompous about. <laughs> Mark Twain was not modest. He was a relentless self-promoter. And I think he would have had to search hard for a basket big enough to hide his bushel under. Still, he exhibits some characteristics of the Virginia gentleman that I will go into now, and we can all evaluate uh, whether or not the claim is a, is a credible one. Mark Twain had immense social assurance. He was a man of social ease that is truly remarkable. He could get along very well, very amiably, and, and uh, 
deep felt affection for the African American butler at his mansion in Hartford, Connecticut. He took a trip back to Hannibal in late midlife and uh, reconnected with his old boyhood chums who take various names in Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. He uh, endeared himself to the most ruthless robber barons of the Gilded Age. He got along famously with literary lions and on his travels with English lords and Russian princes. Most of us were trying to get to endear ourselves to important people use flattery. Mark Twain didn't do this. He didn't know such thing. He approached people with a, with a true sense of a small d Democrat. That meant he, he could speak to everybody directly and, and as, a, as a friend. And for people to whom uh, others use flattery, this was disarming, they found it immensely charming, and they respected him for it. Now, I think that's fascinating to have that kind of, uh, that kind of ease socially, and it's something that I have found among those who are genuine members of the Virginia aristocracy. Second, Mark Twain spoke his mind. Now, this used to be a defining characteristic of Virginia gentlemen, if you go back to the days of Thomas Jefferson or Randolph of Roanoke, and some of these figures. I'm not so sure it is anymore, but there was a sense that uh, with one's social position, there came an obligation, a sort of civic duty to be forthright, to speak your mind, um, not to cause offense unnecessarily, but to be willing to uh, cause some division if you thought the cause was right. Mark Twain was like this. Most of his works, that, and the ones that endure and that, that we, um, uh, we still love, uh, are very amiable books in which he's the butt of most of his own jokes. Uh, but at the same time, some of his writings were very caustic. Um, and on political issues of the day, it's, it's impossible to find a real, I think, coherent political philosophy behind him. But he could be very outspoken. And I think he felt once in a while in duty to, do, to, to be so. This suggests a tremendous assurance about Mark Twain's station in society. And, all, and that's the kind of thing, you look at somebody like, to take an exaggerated example, Winston Churchill. This takes generations to develop this kind of sense of security in one's position in society. But Twain exhibited that, and um, I think it supports the idea that, that he did have some kind of aristocratic ancestry. Third, and this might be my favorite, Mark Twain liked money. <laughs> the true Virginia aristocratic types that I have known, they see no advantage in foregoing the pleasures of life. They like to live well, and it can take money to live well. Mark Twain lived very well. He liked the best champagne. He went to the finest restaurants. He stayed in world-class hotels. And he built a preposterously opulent mansion in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, Mark Twain also thought that he was a terrific businessman. How good a businessman he was, uh, you'll have to read How Not to Get Rich. <laughs> and. Um, Make that assessment for yourself. Uh, so I think, in a sense, his um, claims to be part of the Virginia aristocracy, at least as passed down from his daughter and his uh, paternal father. I guess all fathers are paternal. <laughs> is a is a tentative yes. With this caveat, a lot of these characteristics exist throughout Virginia. And why not, since so many of us are cousins anyway, however many times removed? There was one, there's one major exception to Mark Twain's extravagance. 
He loved cigars. He smoked day and night, as he put it, uh, without, uh, without allowing intervals. He, he said any cigar that cost more than five cents was obviously a foreign uh, derivation and therefore unsmokable. But he said, he, he liked to say he smoked in moderation. I only smoke one cigar at a time. <laughs> I enjoy questions from the, from the crowd, and um, I would offer you one, one last little anecdote here, and then open it up to questions, and I hope, hope we can have a lively discussion. Um, on one of Twain's visits to Richmond, Virginia, he came down with a terrible headache. And a local resident that was with him said, well, you know, it cannot be the food in Richmond. The food in Richmond is terrific. And he said, there is, in fact, no healthier city than Richmond, Virginia. Our death rate is down to one person a day. <laughs> and Twain was unimpressed. He said, then run down to the newspaper office and find out if today's victim has died yet. <laughs> you have been great. I uh, thank you. And we'll, I'd love to take questions. He had mixed feelings about the telephone. Uh, one thing, uh, for all of his terrible investments, he had a chance to make a lot of money. He was offered unlimited amounts of stock in the Bell Telephone Company, and he said, no, he, no, thank you, I don't need it. But he had one of the first telephones installed in a private home, he said, in the world, maybe America, it's one of those claims that's hard to prove or disprove. But he used it. He, he used it connected to the local newspaper office. But he also found that it was very useful if you're trying to reach your doctor and you have a medical emergency and his family was afflicted with all kinds of health problems. At the same time, he said that it was, it was a terrible nuisance. And it was nothing. It just allowed people to annoy each other. Um, so like a lot of things Mark Twain said, you know, he said so much stuff that that it's, it's, po it's possible to get a very nuanced reading there. But yes, he, he, he used the telephone. He just didn't have the good sense to invest in the telephone. You know, I think that Mark Twain, I think that the stories that Mark Twain tells about childhood are, in a sense, everybody's childhood, certainly everybody's boyhood. And I was totally, totally wrapped up in Mark Twain books as a child. And we, I lived on a small farm where we had a pond. And uh, I was determined to build a raft. Uh, you know, float down the Mississippi, I guess. And uh, so I would gather raw, you know, random pieces of lumber from around the, from the barn and nail them all together and strap them together and all this and take them down to the pond and try to make them float. Uh, and apparently one time my father looked out the window and saw me down at the pond with one of my rafts and he said, to my mother, look, Alan's throwing another load of lumber into the pond. <laughs> so so I, I, I've loved Mark Twain my entire life. I love his voice. One of the sad things about finishing How Not to Get Rich was I, um, I missed, his, missed his companionship. He's just the world's most, the great, greatest company. So I, in recent years, I was, for some reason, picked up a copy of the, the first edition of the autobiography, which was in 1927 or something like that. And I was just, I was just born away once again by his, his companionship. And um, then I, this man's fascinating. And so I began to read the standard biographies of Twain. And I thought, 
What's really remarkable here is that the business misadventures are funnier in some respects than the, than the other aspects of, the, of his life and the things that he wrote, um, especially when he's reflecting on these experiences with, his, with a certain detachment and rueful uh, amusement. Uh, and so you've got these ins outlandish stories of his, of his investments and the inventions that he tried to bankroll and the calamities that resulted financially from them. But then you've got his comic uh, reflections on the experience and what it meant and, and how he responded to it. So I thought nobody's really ever done anything with this material. I mean, it's just an, it's an, one of those untold stories, and you, you can't believe somebody else hasn't done this already. So that's what the desire to be with Mark Twain and the desire to tell a, a story about him that had not really been told. Uh, isn't it true that Mark Twain redeemed himself late in life when facing absolute poverty and bankruptcy he gathered his family together and went on a multi-year worldwide speaking tour, not only being able to repay all his debts, but to raise his stature among the business community as someone who was willing to work very hard at an older age to repay his debts. It, yes, yes, yes and no. <laughs> Yes, and that's a very good summation of what happened. In, um, but I want to add to it. When he was about 59, he had invested in two major uh, projects. One was the Webster Publishing Company, a startup publishing firm that he himself ran and, uh, and started, and uh, installed a nephew as the business manager of the company. The first book they published was the world's greatest publishing success to date, and certainly in this country. That was the memoirs of, of uh, General Grant. And they, I think General Grant's widow made $400,000 off the book, and Twain himself made $200,000 off of it. Then they published a string of other books that were disasters, um, and Twain lost I think about $4 million in today's currency on that on that project. The other one, he, he invested in the Page Compositor, which was a machine, very complicated machine for setting newspaper type that he had figured out would be worth billions of dollars and become the industry standard. He, he knew how many newspapers were published in New York and how many pages they published and how fast it would be to, um, to set the type using this machine. And he said, besides that, it's better than the, better than the people who work in the uh, uh, setting type for newspapers because they don't, it doesn't join a union and it doesn't get drunk. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it took so long to bring this thing to market that, that another uh, competitor became the industry standard and Twain lost another $4 million on that. So when he's about 59 years old, he's facing bankruptcy. To, to say p poverty is, is the way he would describe it, but I don't think that's the way most people in his time would have described it. He still lived well. His idea of, of uh, poverty was having to travel throughout Europe and live in nice hotels and, 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 where, and be celebrated where he was known throughout Europe and the, certainly the English-speaking uh, part of the world. Uh, but yes, he, he had tremendous financial reversals and uh, was bleeding money. And it was H.H. H. H. Rogers, the owner of this uh, yacht, the Kanawa, that I mentioned, that he was introduced to. And Rogers had been a fan of Twain since, since Twain was, uh, did his, uh, his lectures on the, on the Sandwich Islands, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, years and years ago. And, Rogers and Twain became fast friends, and, and Rogers, who was at Standard Oil at the time, agreed and volunteered to help Twain sort out his messy finances. Uh, Rogers took charge of the investments. He took charge of the debts and paying the debts and encouraged Twain to go on the lecture tour that you've mentioned, which um, 
uh, he was not in great health at the time. His wife was in, always in fragile health, took one of the daughters, and they went on, I think, about a year and a half, two year lecture tour throughout the English speaking world. Um, and they would, he made tremendous amounts of money, he always did as a lecturer, but he hated doing it. He hated standing in front of a crowd and he felt like making a fool of himself. But he did this to, to build back the bank accounts. And as he, uh, they, they, his wife would send the, send the money right back to Rogers who invested it. So that by the, by the time, within two or three years, he was solvent again and, and uh, Rogers had invested some of the money in stable investments. <laughs> And uh, the family did okay after that. And when Twain died in 1910, he was worth $11 million. Now, um, his last daughter died in the 1960s living in California. And uh, I think she was worth about $6 million at this time because the books just sell and sell and sell. And so one way that Rogers uh, arranged the payment of Twain's debts was to, uh, to have the publishing company declare bankruptcy. But to transfer, before he did that, he transferred the, uh, Twain's assets in the books to his wife, which some have said is fraudulent. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know. Twain did, uh, he, at one point he, he said that he'd finally gotten into the swing of talking about his wife's books. <laughs> if he's in a meeting with, with businessmen or lawyers, he'd say, well, I'm not sure uh, where Mrs. Clemens has decided to publish her next book, uh, we're still, we're, she's still negotiating that. Um, so that, yes, they, he did crawl back to a comfortable life and, and, and uh, lived well to the end of his life. He, uh, uh, he still couldn't stop investing, though. He got very interest, excited uh, at one point about something called plasmon. While they were in Vienna, I believe, he found out about this, this new health food supplement that was, he said, pure albumin and was derived from something, a waste product of the feed to hogs. So he, he invested, I think, over a million dollars in, in this and in starting the American Plasmon Company. And the American Plasmon Company installed himself as president and CEO, and it went bankrupt. It failed, and he, he had another great idea. And if, remember, Rogers uh, uh, wrote him a note and said, you know, do be careful. <laughs> he says, it's easier to get out of it, to stay out of trouble than to get into it, and uh, th than to get out of it, as you well know from past experience. He did, see, he did say that when he was about 62 or something, he said, you know, if, if, if none of this works out, I'll be 64 and I'll just have to start all over. <laughs> yes, sir. What did he think of the military? Did he, uh, he in the military? Yes, he was, if you can call it that. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, in Missouri, uh, slaveholding state, and uh, enlisted in the Marion Rangers. The Marion Rangers was a volunteer militia group, which was basically his boyhood friends. And they thought, what, if, what fun, we'll go out and play soldier for a while. And um, he, wrote, he wrote about that experience in a, a short piece called The Private History of a Campaign That Failed. And uh, it says that he really, uh, uh, they didn't do much real soldiering. What they did was, um, uh, camped out whenever the enemy came near, and they weren't even sure who the enemy was. You know, it, it, a lot of these militia companies, they were to defend the county or defend the town, and, but they weren't sure if who, you know, what side they were on. And it was, a, it was kind of a ridiculous effort that he had a lot of fun writing about. Um, but of course, when the Civil War broke out, he did what a lot of uh, smart people did. He went out west, and that's when his, uh, what, what had happened was after uh, that uh, he had become a riverboat pilot, and when the war came, the uh, trade on the Mississippi stopped, 
and uh, he went with his brother out to Nevada, and his brother had been made secretary to the governor of the territory, something to that effect. And so Twain then used that time to um, uh, prospect for silver and gold and then ended up kind of by accident as a newspaper writer. As for his attitudes toward the military, when he, his, it's better, I guess, to, to look at his attitudes toward, toward war. And he, um, uh, he be, when he moved to Connecticut, and he married the daughter of an Elmira, New York coal baron. He, uh, he became, in William Dean Howell's words, like the least Southern Southerner he'd ever met. He totally Yankeeized. And uh, he became a tremendous admirer of, uh, of General Grant. And uh, in fact, he met, he met, the second time he met Grant, he, uh, his friend that was going to introduce them again said he's, uh, he's not sure that Grant would remember him. He said, yeah, I'll re he would remember me because the last time I was the only person in line who didn't ask him for a job. <laughs> and late, late in life, became, T Twain be wrote the, the War Prayer, which is a kind of a anti-war document. Um, I think he always, he always respected soldiers and respected officers and, and had a tremendous affection for Grant, um, but had mixed feelings about the business of war. Uh, there's, you know, that's that. <laughs> Scholars are going to be arguing about that forever. He, the, 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 apparently it's a term from uh, measuring the depth of, uh, of you know, on the passage of a riverboat, right? But it's turned out in recent years that there was someone else in New Orleans, Louisiana, who wrote, wrote short items about the riverboat trade who used the, the name Mark Twain. So he didn't... He didn't invent that. He, he purloined it, I think is a fair way to put it. He, he borrowed it. But, it. but I think it was a tribute to his, to his days on the rivers, which he always held in, with, with, in great, with great effect, great respect. Uh, two questions. Was Tom Sawyer the first novel written on a typewriter? Or is that an apocryphal story? And then the other question is, uh, what was Twain's daily writing ritual, if he had one? First, he claimed, I think, that, that Huck Finn was the first written on a typewriter. Uh, I don't believe that there's a manuscript copy. If, if, that, if that's actually true, I don't think there's a manuscript copy of it that um, exists. I'm not a scholar. In a scholar, you have to know everything. You know, I've, I've given a lot of talks about Thomas Jefferson. and. Um, I always know there are two or three people, and even if there are 10 people in the, in the vast hordes of people that show up to, to hear me, there's going to be two of them that have taught Jefferson for 40 years and <laughs> will assassinate me. Um, I, don't think there is a, I don't think there is a manuscript. I think Twain did, I know he did own a typewriter, an early typewriter, and, and played around with it. Um, but I think it's probably apocryphal that he wrote an entire novel on it. He also tried dictating at one point and didn't like that. Um, the other question. Oh, his daily, I don't understand this at all. His daily writing routine. This man was enormously uh, prolific. And he was, had a tremendous amounts of energy, just unbelievable. I mean, we think, you know, you could, he thought he could write Huckleberry Finn in about three months. It took him six years, not because he wasn't writing regularly, but because he was so involved in some of these business projects. Um, and he would, tell the, he would tell the people running the publishing company, stop worrying about Huckleberry Finn. I'm still inventing the baby bed clamp to keep children from kicking the infants from kicking the bedclothes off their cribs. Um, so it took him six years to write that. It's very difficult to figure out how he did what he did, because he wrote immense amounts of stuff. He was socializing every night. He uh, uh, would play billiards for hours on end with his friends. Uh, and, and so if I knew the secret, maybe it was that maybe he was eating plasmin 
the health food additive. I wish I knew. It's like, it's like Lincoln said of, uh, of Grant, well, you know, find out what, what he's drinking and send it to all my other generals. <laughs> if, I could, if I knew how Twain did what he did, I would do it. <laughs> yeah? Twain called golf a good walk spoil. Yeah, I, th uh, I think that's probably what most endeared him to me. He, the que uh, question was, uh, uh, why did he say that golf was a good walk spoiled? <laughs> Twain was a tremendous walker. He wrote, if you read, um, a tr I think a, the book A Tramp Abroad, he, and the, he, he would take walks, he would walk miles and miles and miles with a friend and just talk. Go from city to city in, in Europe, in Germany, uh, where they traveled, he and the, um, uh, uh, Joe Twitchell, who was the, one of his closest friends was the uh, rector, probably not the right word, of the Congregational Church in Hartford, and Twain became very, very close friends, and they traveled in Europe together. Uh, at one point, they are um, walking somewhere, and some college students pick them up, and they're, the college students give them a ride in the next town, and they're just thrilled. They've, you know, got to meet Mark Twain. Uh, so, I, so as much as he enjoyed walking, I think that golf probably took, con, took too much concent, I don't golf, so I don't know, took too much concentration and he couldn't like carry on a monologue the way he usually enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. Is there any evidence that uh, at some point in his life, uh, Mark suffered from severe you know, it's in, in, re, in, re, in uh, researching Jefferson. Uh, you would, there were lots of claims that Jefferson had also, uh, had Asperger's syndrome, and and I can't I, I I think there's very little evidence for that. I also think there's there's very little evidence that Twain had uh, depression uh, because he was so pr productive. And he was also so social. Now, I, uh, you know, it might be like trying to diagnose the president. You know, <laughs> it's it's hard to know what goes on in somebody's own mind, right? <laughs> uh, but I, I think that if he were, if he, if he had depression, he would. There would have been periods where he was not particularly productive. That's a guess. Um, there, there, he has periods of he has periods of immense euphoria, but these things seem to be within hours. You know, he'd be very excited about some prospect, and then he finds out, oh, we lost five million dollars, and he's despondent. And his wife talks to him, and he paces the floor, and he drinks a little, and he smokes fifteen cigars, and he has a friend over, and they play billiards. And the next day, he's excited about the next thing. So there's a resilience in his personality that doesn't suggest depression to me. But there's certainly mood swings. Maybe that's a better way. The man is always uh, suffering from mood swings. Uh, he has a, the nephew who he put in charge of the publishing company said that, said that he's a devil to, be, to do business with, but you can't help loving him. And I think that's, I think that's kind of the kind of personality he was. He'd be very difficult. He, he learned once that, he, and I can't remember how he learned it, but he wrote to Howells, I believe, and he said, I've just learned that my daughters are scared of me. And he, it tor tormented him because he was so, just such an affectionate family man and just adored his daughters. And the idea that they were intimidated by his outbursts sometimes or wounded him deeply. So there's a... A very complicated man. If I understood why he did what he did, I'd, I'd write a book about that and retire. Are there any Twain uh, descendants currently? And um, where do royalties go today? Oh, I wish you wouldn't have asked that. Um, <laughs> I don't think there are descendants, direct descendants. He had the, the daughter that died in the 1960s in California, had no children. Um, as far as the, the, where the royalties go today, I don't know, honestly. I'll find out and get back to you. <laughs> they go somewhere because there's a lot of money there. Um, 
Twain's yeah. father, I believe, died when Twain was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. The family's fortunes, um, as little as they were, collapsed. His mother took in boarders. Mm -hmm. He went on the road as a printer's devil, and as you mentioned, mm -hmm. later as a pilot on the Mississippi. But I think there's, uh, I know that what I've read is that when he was um, received a degree at Oxford late in life, they commented on the fact that he was a self-learner, that he became a writer through force of his own intellect and mm -hmm. not through schooling. Could you kind of comment on his development as a writer and intellectual? Yeah, I, I think that um, his education ended very early, his formal education. He, but he was, a, uh, for a person who's not a systematic thinker, he's, he's a, just a grab bag of ideas and notions and things that he doesn't pursue with the rigor of a Henry James, or William James. He's a, um, he's a kind of, uh, he's a total autodidact. He learns by doing and learns by reading. He, he uh, uh, was not an intellectual in any sense. Although I think, you know, people think of Thomas Jefferson as the great Francophile. Jefferson never learned French. He lived in France, never learned French. Twain lived in Germany and taught himself German. He's a tremendous intellect. His, his mother was a very lively, funny woman. And, um, and Twain was always a reader. He said one of his, when he, when he worked in a bookstore in Hannibal, Missouri as a, child, as a young boy, he said that, uh, that, he never, that, that the customers were always getting in his way and never allowing him to read in peace. <laughs> he also worked in a drugstore and said that his prescriptions weren't very good and they ended up selling more, more uh, stomach pumps than soda water. <laughs> uh, and, and if I understand, you know, he read widely uh, and, and yet uh, not systematically, I don't think, which is part of the charm, part of the charm of the man. How did uh, he get along with Harriet Beecher Stowe and the other folks at Nook Farm that he lived in Hartford? They seem to have accepted him as much of a provincial as he was. Um, I, think, I think this part of that question of being a, being a whether or not he had some gentility in his background. For such a rough character right out of the mining camps of the West, he adjusted very well uh, to high society and to the, these weren't, these were, the people, Nook Farm was a community in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, settled by, tended to be uh, very well educated, kind of socially progressive people. Harriet Beecher Stowe was a neighbor. And he, got on, he seems to have gotten on fine with these people. And there's not even a lot of uh, evidence of his wife, who was genteel and educated and all of that, how of her kind of schooling him and how to behave, how to, you know, which fork to use and all that kind of thing. There's no, there, I don't get any evidence that there was much of that. I think he came, you know, he had a sort of a quality about him to, uh, to, to absorb all of that and, and, uh, and get by and to be accepted in all levels of society. And he seems to have gotten on fine with, with Harry Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, he did say that in, in later years, uh, she, would, she became very eccentric and would enter other people's houses and they'd be reading a newspaper or something and she'd let out a whoop behind them and scare the living daylights out of them. <laughs> But they seem to have been, it was a community where, it, for its time, people would just seem to have had a level of, of neighborly informality that was rare for its time. Probably, we would think they were very stuffy, I don't know. But he got on fine there. I mean, he, again, he could blend, without being a sociopath, <laughs> he could blend into any, any circumstances. Last question, anybody? Well, thank you very much, Alan.